October 3rd, 1991. I can remember when they put the first stoplight on the main street in Big River. Everybody complained it backed up traffic too much. Around 5 o'clock on a Friday night, there could be as many as five cars waiting for the light to change. When I was a kid, I liked to sit on my bike beside the Optimist bench downtown and listen to the old-timers, like Andy McAndrew and Roly Miles and Jake Bresseau with only one hand. A man could die breathing all these exhaust fumes. Funny how life works out. Walker. Hey, Krista. Where are you? Young and Gerard. It's like a circus down here. Hey, it's Friday night. Yeah. Are you homesick, Walker? Nope. Corner at Dundas and Sherburn. A guy will be standing there. Doing what? God knows. Actually, there were only two places you could be in Big River at quarter to one. At home or not at home. Every kid knew that. Either you waited in your bed for the sound of your father to finally open the door, bang around downstairs, and stagger off to bed. Or he was already home. That was the difference. How are you tonight, sunshine? I'm okay. Yeah, you call a cab. I had a pickup. Yeah, I called it. Drive up the street, sunshine. Until I tell you to stop. You get all kinds. This was one of them. I looked in the mirror. He was looking back at me, smiling. A big man with a horse face and bright eyes, big horse teeth and small horse ears. I thought to myself, this is the night I get killed. I could see it in the paper. Cabby murdered, throat slit, mother furious. I told him not to go to the city, she said. Anywhere in particular? No. So, you're one of Piatelli's drivers, eh? Yeah, you know him? He's a great guy, Mr. Piatelli. You have to get used to his joke, and that's all. At first, I didn't know whether he was mad at me or what, because he was always gearing me around. But then I got used to him, and I figured, well... Shut up. What? You heard me. Right. You see this here? Yeah. Give it to my friend, Alfonso. Tell him a special delivery for the angel. Pull over. How old are you? Nineteen. What's your name? Walker. Yeah? Maybe you and me. We could have breakfast together sometime. He smiled a weird smile at me like Hannibal the Cannibal or somebody and got out. Once in a while you pick up a fare. When they're gone you want to roll down all the windows with this guy. I wanted to get out of the cab myself and set it on fire. Mr. Pinatelli, special delivery. Hey, hey, what's this? A friend of yours. He told me to give it to you. Oh, yeah? Money? I don't know. What friend? He didn't say. He just handed me that envelope. He wasn't going anywhere in oh. particular. Oh, no. Oh, well, no. What is it, Mr. Piatelli? Who gave you this? He, he didn't say. He was a big guy. He said it was a special delivery for the angel. Oh, mother. Mary, all the saints in heaven, oh, God. Mr. Piatelli oh, wasn't looking all that well, oh, but he moved his 300 pounds faster than I'd ever seen him move before. Straight up the wooden flight of stairs over the garage floor to his apartment, opened the heavy green metal door, and slammed it shut. He stayed up there for three days. Well, that's what we all thought. Nobody saw him. Go up there. Oh, jeez, I don't know. Go up there. What good would it do? Everybody's been knocking on his door for two days, even his bookie. He didn't come out for his bookie. He's not going to come out for... I don't mean that. I mean get in somehow. Break in if you have to. Oh, jeez. Maybe he just wants some privacy. Walker, are you stupid or what? It's been three days. Well, you saw what he was like. I'm going to call 911. Okay, I'll go up. I'll go. What's the matter anyway? You've been running around helping other people out. Now someone you actually know is in trouble. Well, he's a guy. It's, it's his place. It's his business. If he wanted help, he would... What? So if he were a woman, it'd be different? Ah. Uh, yeah. You know something? What? That's so dumb. Now, would you get up there? The thing about Krista, you never have to wonder what she's thinking. Krista. She's about 100 pounds, maybe. 
sits in her wheelchair on a kind of angle, looking sweet and fragile, till you get to know her. I knocked on both doors, the one in the garage and the one in the back of the building that once used to lead to a rusty old fire escape but now opened up on midair in a two-story drop. No answer. So I stood on top of the ladder in the dark, wrapped an oily rag around my hand, and punched in the back door window. Hello? Mr. Piatelli? Are you in there? Mr. Piatelli? Mr. Piatelli? No 300 pounds of enraged Piatelli. Nothing. Just really, eerily, silent. What does the apartment of a man who drives a 1959 pink Cadillac and wears four gold chains around his neck look like? I expected, I don't know, a television that covered one wall, a well-stocked bar with leather stools, shag carpeting, maybe a bedroom decorated in black and silver with a circular bed and a mirror on the ceiling, and pink lights somehow, pink lights. It didn't look like that at all. The outside door opened into the kitchen and it was bright and clean. Tidy. His office downstairs was a mess. Maybe there were two Piatellis. Hello? There were heavy curtains across the window in the living room and massive furniture sitting in the gloom that looked old and polished and plush. But that's not what caught my eye. What caught my eye were the shelves on the walls. Rows and rows of shelves and sitting on the shelves staring back at me glowing palely in the dark. Rows and rows of dolls. Beautiful china dolls, looking very old in yellowing costumes. A few miniature baby buggies made of wicker and children's toys made out of tin. Mr. Piatelli was a doll collector. I looked into the bedroom, switched on the light. A few clothes were strewn over the bed, as if he had sorted through some things packing in a hurry, and beside the bed on an old worn rug that looked to me like it came from India, a piece of a photograph. I picked it up, some older woman's face squinting into the sun. And I looked in the wastebasket, inside it the crumpled envelope I had given to Mr. Piatelli from the guy in the cab, and more pieces of the photograph. I fitted them together. The woman was standing in a backyard beside an old wooden fence. Two young boys were standing beside her, one maybe 18, the other 12. They had their arms around her, their mother probably. There was an alley behind them, a tangle of telephone poles and wires. The woman had an apron on. It was blowing a little in the wind. They all looked happy. But his car's still here. It's parked right outside. He never goes anywhere without that pink Cadillac. It's famous. Maybe that's why. But no one saw him leave. Well, that's possible. He could have gone out the other way through that room where they play poker and out the side. So, what's it like up there, Walker? Well, it's different. Yeah? So, like what? Walker? Well, he collects dolls. What? What kind of dolls? Doll dolls, you know, like... Little girl dolls, but old ones, antiques. He's a doll collector. Alfonso Piatelli collects dolls? Yeah. Come on, Walker. I've known him since since I was three. No, really. And his place, it's nice. Old furniture, too. Like they've been made by craftsmen. He likes old stuff. Alfonso Piatelli? Why didn't he tell me he liked dolls? I don't know. Maybe he thought you'd laugh. I know you wouldn't, but maybe he thought you would, you know? That stupid stoop. Where is he, anyway? What's wrong with him? Walker. I showed Krista the piece together photograph. It didn't mean anything to her, either. A mother, two sons. It looked old, somehow. Maybe the late 50s. The clothes, the leaning old telephone poles, the photograph itself. Before the 60s, anyway. The oldest boy had sideburns, and his hair was combed up in two greasy rolls that met and fell over the middle of his forehead. And huge ears. Mr. Piatelli has big ears. It's right in here. I make up 12 post-dated checks every September the 1st. How about a brother? Never mentioned one to me. Okay, here's his mother's file. Loretta Sophia Piatelli. Talks about her a lot. 
He calls her Mama. That explains the doll. Walker, what do you call your mother? Geronimo. Really? Well, not to her face. It was just between me and my sisters. Oh? How many sisters? Six of them. Oh? Well, that explains a lot about you, too. What do you mean? Oh, well, nothing. Oh, come on. What do you mean? Hmm? Sometimes Krista can be a giant pain, especially when she gets that look on her face, like she knows something you don't, even though she doesn't, though you're not sure and she won't say anything more so you can prove it, and it drives you crazy. I know that look. I grew up with that look. It drives you crazy. Yes, Mr. Devereaux, Mrs. Piatelli has been a resident of ours for many years, but I'm afraid I can't let you see her. Oh, why not? I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to tell you why not. Are you a relative? No, I, well, I work for her son, Alfonso Piatelli. Yes. And, uh, well, we haven't seen him for a few days, and the bunch of us were worried. He went away kind of abruptly, and I thought maybe his mother might know something about it. Well, uh, Mrs. Piatelli is not well. She, she hasn't been for some time. You know, I'm quite certain she wouldn't know the whereabouts of her son. Oh, well... Uh, if you see him, could you tell him to call the garage? Let someone know what's going on? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, Mr. Devereaux, I'll walk you to your car. A cab. Like I said, I work for Mr. Piatelli. He was here, wasn't he? I mean, in the last couple of days. How did you know that? Because you didn't say he wasn't. The truth is, I'm feeling somewhat concerned about Mr. Piatelli myself. Well, and if you can help him. He was terribly agitated when he arrived here. It gave me strict instructions that absolutely no one was to be allowed in to see his mother. He wanted to hire a security service for her. Well, I told him we could hardly allow that. So he settled for a 24-hour nursing service so that someone would be at her bedside at all times. Why? He wouldn't say. But uh, that's not the worst of it. When I walked him back to the parking lot, there was something smeared across his windshield. It was... Uh, it was blood, Mr. Devereaux. What did Mr. Piatelli do? Nothing. At, at first, I thought he was going to faint. He leaned on the car, and then he said, some damn kids must be playing a joke. Fake blood. And then he laughed. But it was rather a ghastly laugh. I brought him some water and a rag, and he washed it off. It made me swear to look after his mother. And then he drove away. I know blood when I see it, Mr. Perhaps it was animal blood. I don't know. But it was blood. It was almost dark by the time I arrived back at the garage. I took a walk around the back of the building. I thought I might have another look through Mr. Piatelli's apartment, not really sure what I was looking for. What could be more ordinary than a couple of kids and their mother happy together in their own backyard? Alfonso and his mama, Loretta, and... Who? A younger brother? I'm calling the cops. Oh, oh, what for? Well, for one thing, there's been a B and E right over our heads. Well, that's not all. Whoever it was, he sat the dolls in a circle on the floor, all their faces and eyes methodically broken, and he sprinkled blood on them. That does it! Krista, wait. What for? Because Mr. Piatelli didn't call the cops himself, and because I think we've still got time. If this guy wanted to get Mr. Piatelli, he could have got him here at the garage or at the nursing home. He was there, too. But he didn't. Because something else is going on. Like what? Like, I don't know yet. Terrific. But Mr. Piatelli does know. If we could find him, maybe we could help him out. He's scared. I'm scared. You'd be scared, too, if you were normal. Where would he go if he wanted to hide out? I don't know. Well, think about it, Okay. Does he own a cottage? No. Some place out of town? No. Some relative somewhere? Well, of course he has relatives somewhere. Everybody has relatives somewhere. Okay, he owns some places in town. He does? Yeah. 
He owns a row house and a couple of detached ones around Queen and Broadview. But he rents them out. I enter the rent checks every month. Oh. Walker, one of those places, there's some young guys in it. They were about three months behind in their rent. Alfonso said he was going to kick them out. They were wrecking the place, he said. Then it could be empty now. It is empty. I parked the car about three blocks away from the address Krista had given me in case I was being followed. Sat in the cab for a while, rolled the smoke, stuck in a tape and watched. It was about one in the morning. Somebody's father staggered by, wending his slow, crooked way home. That was about it. No parked car lurking in the shadows behind me. I got out. Mr. Piatelli, are you in there? It's me, Walker. Mr. Piatelli? Mr. Piatelli! I stood on the back stoop of the house Mr. Piatelli owned. The skeleton of what had once been a truck was sitting in the backyard. The grass was almost up to my waist. Mr. Piatelli? The door opened slowly, very slowly. Then this large, white hand floated out of the darkness towards me. It was large enough to be attached to 300 pounds. Mr. P. Suddenly the hand had me by the shirt and jerked me in through the door like a minnow being jerked out of a fish pond. Walker? Yeah, it's me. It's me. Turn on the light. What are you, crazy? I ain't turned on his light for nobody. A bulky shadow moving down a hallway. I followed him. There was a faint glow at the end of the hall. Mr. Piatelli turned into our room. Come in here. Don't say nothing. Just shut up. He had nailed some canvas drop sheets over the windows. There was a painter's scaffold and a couple of buckets of paint. A candle burning, the stubs of several others, pizza boxes, beer cans, cigarette butts, and graffiti all over the two walls that hadn't been painted. Oh, you see this? I'm a hunted animal. That's what I am. How'd you get here? Drove the cab. Or park my bloody cab in front of this house? I'll kill you. No, 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 I didn't. It's a few blocks away. I was careful. Nobody followed me. Yeah, you hope. I hope. Then Mr. Piatelli raised up his hand. There was a revolver in it the size of a suitcase. He comes in here. It's a dead man. I mean, that's all there is to it. A dead man. How'd you find me? Krista. Yeah, of course, Krista. What a mouth. She's really worried, Mr. Piatelli. We're all worried. Whatever's wrong, we want to help. Yeah? If he hurts Mama, what'll I do? What'll I do? Oh, she's all right. I was there this afternoon. No kidding. Oh, that's good. I mean, that's that's good. Mr. Piatelli, I think we've got some time to sort things out. He was just threatening. That photograph, the blood on the windshield, the dolls. The the what? Oh. Um, somebody got into your apartment. I think it was the same guy. He, uh, well, he broke your dolls. Mr. Piatelli looked at me, his face as large and white as the moon. You saw my dolls? Yeah. Oh, they're terrific. It's a great collection. It must have taken you years to, you know, collect. I think they're great. And the toys and things. He, uh, broke their heads. Mr. Piatelli just stared at me for a moment. Then suddenly he turned away. One huge, meaty hand began to rub away at his eye. He kept his face turned for a long while. I didn't know what to do. Maybe you'll be able to fix them. 35 years. <sighs> Collection takes me 35 years. The first one, my little sister's. She died of scarlet fever. Four years old. So I kept it. Then I just started to buy things, you know, toys, things... Uh, the more I bought, the, the more I got interested in their history, stuff like that, you know? You understand? Sure. Yeah, I, I could be collecting cars, anything. So he, he, he trashed them, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Piatelli, that photograph of you and your mother, who else is in it? The younger guy. What are you, what, are you crazy? That's not me, that's not my mother, that's him, for God's sake, his mother. Who's? I'm going to need somebody on the outside. I need a go-between. How about it, Walker? Could you do that for me? Yeah, I could. 
Okay. <sighs> Hogan. It's Mouse Hogan. His, his mother, his, his younger brother. We all grew up in the, in the neighborhood. This one. This was my old home. My mom is home. We had a gang, you know, a bunch of kids. It was Mouse's gang. I wasn't really in it, but I had to be in it. You understand? I mean, you're in or they kill you. I mean, that's how you think when you're a kid, right? <sighs> Mouse called me Angel because he knew I didn't like what was going on. Oh, you couldn't call him Mouse, though. You know, big ears. Big ears? Yeah. You know, Mickey Mouse behind his back. He was mean. He was crazy mean. He was nuts. We used to hang around the hotels and parks, you know, roll drunks. <sighs> One night, we're emptying out this wino's pockets. He wakes up and he grabs the mouse. And, and the guy's as strong as a bear. You'd never believe it. So well, we're kids. We run. And now, he smashes mouse's face into a wall and bloodies him up a little. Later that night, I'm laying up on the roof. I mean, it's so hot. And I see the mouse. He's climbing over the backyard fence. He's got something in his hand. Out of curiosity, I follow him. He walks through the park. He finds the same guy. Oh, he's passed out good now. He's sleeping on the grass. Mouse stands over him. He looks around. Oh, I can still see his face. His face, it looks weird, like he's high on something. And then he pours stuff out of the can he has in his hands all over the guy, from his head to his feet. And the guy begins to stir. He sits up. Mouse lights a match. And the guy just explodes. I mean, it lights up the whole park. This guy, he never even made it to his knees. He just rolls a little. And he lies still. You know, Mouse disappears. And me, I, I run too. And the cops come around. They question everybody in the neighborhood. And I, I can't stand it, what I saw. So I tell them, I have to go to court. You know, the whole thing. Mouse is 19. They send him away. Manslaughter, 20 years, 12 certain. And one night, his mother, she takes an overdose of pills, kills herself. It's him in that photograph. His mama, his brother... This is what he gives me. This is what he's telling me. So the guy in the cab... It's Hogan. Oh. Every year, every Christmas, that maniac sends me a card from prison to the angel. He kills some guy in a riot. More years, more cards. I wait for them like a knife in the gut. And this year, no card. He's out. Mr. Pietelli. Listen. I leave here. I'm a dead man. You you do something for me, okay? His brother, Terry, he's a gambler. I know the guy. He's okay. He's in his right mind. I'll send you to him, all right? You tell him what's going on. Maybe Terry can stop you. <laughs> shh, shh. What's that? What? Shh, that. I don't hear. Shh. Don't. Don't. Mr. Pietelli put one hand up and bent over at the waist, cocking his ear towards the hall. We both stood frozen for a moment. Straining to hear. Mr. Pietelli crept out of the room, his revolver leading the way, and began to move silently down the hallway towards the dark kitchen. I followed him, his huge bulk moving silently through the gloom. Then he stopped. It was coming from outside, by the door. Mr. Pietelli took one more step into the kitchen. Suddenly, there was a shadow at the kitchen window behind the curtains. A face, then pointed ears, an arching back. Tail. Ah! She's hungry to go nuts. Oh, God, that's what's happening. I'm going nuts in here. Mr. Piatelli, listen. I'll be your go-between, I promise, but just let me make one call first. Yeah? To who? To the police. <laughs> AP cab. Okay. 290 Duncan, right? Apartment? Okay. Eddie, you there? Where are you now? Good. 290 Duncan, side door. Yeah. Hi, Krista. How's Mr. Piatelli? Okay, I guess. He's trying to glue his dolls back together. 
I'm supposed to be helping. Look at all these broken heads. At least he's not hiding them in his apartment like they're something to be ashamed of. Yeah. I still don't understand why he didn't just call the cops. I don't know. He called them once, a long time ago. It cost them a lot, I think. Funny. How people seem to be. You know, they really are inside, eh? Right. Yeah. Anyway, that, that guy, that crazy guy, how'd you know that he wasn't Mouse Hogan? Ears. Ears? Ears. The guy in the cab had little horse ears. Hogan's ears stick out like sails. You could see it in the photograph. Ears don't change much, do they? I guess not. But there could have been two of them, the guy in the cab and Hogan. And I just figured, what do killers do? They might catch you first, then try to scare you, but they don't scare you first, then try to catch you. Didn't make sense. So, that's why I called Inspector Kiss. He checked. Mouse Hogan died peacefully in prison last November. And the guy in the cab? A prison buddy of Hogan's. He knew the story. When he got out this summer, he went straight to Hogan's young brother, Terry. They cooked it up between them. After I talked to Inspector Kiss, he wanted me to meet with Terry Hogan, so I did. And Hogan said, Yeah, I could call off my brother. Cost Piatelli 200000 <laughs> He wanted cash. Now, he even gave me an account number for Mr. Piatelli to wire the money into. A scam. I think Mr. Piatelli would have gone for it, too. So now what happens? Nothing. Mr. Piatelli called Terry. They had a long talk. Then he told Inspector Kiss he wasn't going to press charges. Hey, Walker, you got a big mouth, too, eh? Uh, you got nothing to do, the two of you? Yeah, I'm fixing your dolls. Yeah, well, here's some more pieces. Goes with this one. What are you looking at? Nothing. Aren't you supposed to be driving a cab or something? It's too early. Hey, Alfonso, why didn't you charge them? They were scamming you. Yeah, well... Well, like I said to Terry, you know, a lot of years, the Piatellis and the Hogans, now we're even. And now it's over. You have just heard Midnight Cab, Episode 3, The Mystery of the Horse-Faced Man, written by James W. Nichol. Featured in the cast were David Ferry as Walker and Jacqueline Samuda as Krista with Howard Jerome as Mr. Piatelli. You heard Frank Moore as Whip and the rest home manager was Dennis O'Connor. Music for this series is composed by Milan Kimlicka and the series cast and consultant is Linda Grierson. Our recording engineer is Joanne Anka with sound effects by Matt Wilcott. The series production assistant is Nancy Dow. Midnight Cab is produced and directed in Toronto by Bill Howell.